We are here to share a vision and invite you to join us. Throughout this conference, you've heard strong arguments for making nature investable, turning the business case for saving the planet into reality. We've heard that we must start valuing nature, paying for its services, or at least for any sustainable use of it. You've also heard the call for regulation, for monet monetizing nature, and making it, it attractive to capital markets. Most importantly, you've heard from the mouth of the most influential climate scientist, Johann, um, Johann Röckström, that it is the global collapse of biodiversity we need to fix first, before worrying about reaching ambitious or less ambitious climate goals. And Sandrine's message yesterday, we are nature and nature is us, captures this mission. But above all, we agree on one thing. We have no time to lose in halting biodiversity loss. If we are to achieve the Kanming Montreal 30 by 30 target to protect 30% of land by 2030 and halt biodiversity loss, it is obvious that most urgently and fast we must protect the 2.3% of land that harbors of all 40% of all terrestrial life, terrestrial species, the planet's biodiversity hotspots. You, um, these areas, as shown on the map, are concentrated in rainforests across Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Southeast Asia. So if these areas are saved, we also saved nearly half of the species on land. This exactly is our goal of Nature Wealth Foundation, maximizing impact on biodiversity, biodiversity preservation by focusing on the irreplaceable biodiversity hotspots. We want to do this by enabling investment in nature, naturepreneurship, and activating the private sector to fill the financial gaps hindering conservation in the global, global south. This is no small task. Protecting these areas requires long-term protection, management and close monitoring, not just creating reserves on paper. But we believe we can succeed. We have a scalable proof of concept in Ecuador, expertise in biodiversity monitoring, and 70 years of ground experience with the Frankfurt Zoological Society as our partner. Our immediate goal is to establish a 300 million euro fund to acquire, lease or contract land to create core conservation areas, which will be protected alongside restoration areas and buffer zones in which sustainable businesses involving the local communities can thrive. Our vision is that the Hope Spot reserves of this first fund will harbor 30% of all terrestrial species. We are currently working on that. And if you think, if the, global biodiversity, if the biodiversity credit markets develops, this will be one of the best investments you can make. If the market doesn't develop, the case of investment will be, at the very least, that investing companies can report measurably maintain protection or restoration of the most valuable species-rich ecosystems. Now, let's discuss three reasons of why this is the right time to act and embark on such an ambitious mission. Um, we, reason one, we see AI, enhanced biodiversity measuring and monitoring, as the game-changer for protecting and financing nature. Martin, can you please explain that this is the start of a new, new era for nature conversa conservation? Sure. I'd like to start with a positive message, because what you can see is it takes just one human generation to regenerate a rainforest, arguably the most complex ecosystem on Earth. And what you can see here, that's a pasture about 100 football fields large, and within 20 years or 27 years, actually, on the pasture, 20 years if you start with a cacao plantation, you got animals back 
at a level that we see in the rainforest. So that's a message of hope. It's doable. We can do this. And now, next one, please. What you saw before is the work of 10 PhD students. What you can see here is we can scale that very rapidly. And you can see that birds come back very rapidly, frogs come back very rapidly, and most importantly, we can use AI to identify bird sounds, and with a very simple model, these are results of last year, only 75 bird species included into that AI model, you can predict the recovery of those birds, and you can predict bird diversity. So far, so good. You can do the same thing, use bird song, and predict the recovery of frogs. A little bit more surprising. Most importantly, you can also use the same model to show the dark matter of biodiversity. What we see here are 4,800 insects that we caught in a single night. Um, night insects, moth primarily, that's about twice as many as we find in all Germany during all of the year. Um, so this is a dark matter of biodiversity um, that we don't know. And yet again, you can also trace that with a very simple model of AI. So it tells us today, we've got the tools to actually deliver conservation on the ground. And this year, our new models uh, are about four times as powerful. Uh, we are almost at 100% with the bird species. We got to 70% that we can predict on the frogs. And don't be mistaken, these are most biodiverse areas in the world, as uh, Augusta has shown. And there is a lot of species that we don't know, frogs, mammals, whatever. Um, and still, we can predict their recovery. And so now, we can do better than we've ever done in the past. Thank you. Corbinian, can you add to this why biodiversity monitoring enhanced by AI, AI, AI sorry, is a game changer also for financing nature? Yeah, with the eye on the clock, I make it very short. Um, there's a reason why um, the finance sector avoided the biodiversity space, because there was no story to tell in, within an Excel sheet. And, we need something, when family offices, investors want to invest in something, we need something which fits into their language. And now we have live um, data to biodiversity. We can also measure the change between one year, that's very different to carbon credits. And, and, and these, these data now allows us to build a product or even an asset class which then can be translated in finance. So this really can a, be a game changer to activate the private sector. Thank you. And the, the second reason why it's the right time to act is the pending transformation of economy. Can you, act, can you explain? Yeah. So um, when we step back uh, one second, we have a huge financial gap for biodiversity. It's about billions we need every year. And we, as the community, decided that we have to activate the private sector if we want to close it. And there we have a lot of movements, and it's changing a lot. Regulation does actually, in some part, fantastic work. Uh, work. Um, two days ago, when we met with these companies, um, we heard that over 100 people in nearly each company work on how we change uh, our business. Um, and we have something like the carbon market, which starts that we can activate the private sector. Um, and actually, this is, despite all the despair we sometimes feel, this is something really fantastic we now have. And, um, and then we also, but we now need, when we want to connect to, to all these elements, we need that's a top-down approach, and we now have to be uh, work from the button up, that we come from nature and look, um, we call it naturepreneurship, with which models we can, in practice, dock on these um, developments. Thank you. Um, maybe, Christoph, you can, can um, add your perspective on, on the pending transformation out of the now, of course, finally, we talk nature, we talk biodiversity, we talk protected areas. You mentioned the 30 by 30. No? And then we have to talk money as well. So what does it cost to save the world? What does it cost now actually to protect the areas? There's no, no easy answer to, to that. Now, in some areas like South America, you can put a, 
um, a strategic ranger post uh, in the forest, and by that you can control quite a lot of hinterland. Now, you can have a, a, a boat on the river, uh, you can have an eye in the sky. Um, uh, in some areas in Africa, you need quite, uh, quite sophisticated operations. You need, might be 500 rangers to protect the park. You need planes, you need helicopters, you need dog units, um, and you need operational rooms like this one. Now, um, overall, what we can say, it takes, of course, people now to protect uh, the last protected and most important biodiversity places in the world. And when we look at the money side now, um, it's, it's very different now from area to area, as you have seen in the pictures. Sometimes you can protect a large park with 30 rangers. Sometimes you need more than 300 now. You need control posts. You need equipment. What is also very important is not to work only in, in the park, but mainly also outside the park now. So to have community work, uh, look for a more sustainable lifestyle out the park. You need education. You need friends and not enemies around your parks now. And of course, finally, what you're protecting is ecosystem services for the communities surrounding the protected areas. I put you here a few numbers now. So with one to five million per year, I would say that's a, that's a good rough estimate for a, a large park of 10,000 square kilometers. We need, by the way, we need really large parks now to protect ecosystems and functioning ec ecosystems. Just to give you a number, 10,000 square kilometers, this is five times all the land of all the 16 national parks in Germany together in one park. Now, so that is the dimension we are talking. We are talking parks in the tropics in the global south, big as European countries. Now, that is what we have to protect now. And um, yeah, what we also see, and Corbinian mentioned that, we are completely out of scale with the value of these areas and what money is provided. And I gave you here a few numbers. Germans, Germans alone invest 40 billion, 40,000 million in cosmetics per year now. When we look at the Ahrtal flood now, that has cost the taxpayer 40 billions of euros now. And um, yeah, when, when, when we look at COVID, 350, uh, 100 billions uh, for the economy, 50 million for the taxpayer, 400 billions now for, uh, for the COVID um, pandemics. And then you look at what we need for the parks, it's little, tiny, little money, and we don't have it now globally. We have a gap of 700 billion annually in that now. And when you then look at the, at the services provided by nature, now when you look just on pollination, this is calculated to be uh, 20,000 um, billion in uh, production now. Uh, 20,000 million in production. So, yeah, you see, it's completely out of scale now what we invest for nature and what we have to in invest for nature. And there are some good models like the legacy landscape now where one million per year is provided for the park and we need the money on long run for perpetuity. That's the perspective we have to create. That's a good transition because landscape leg legacy channels um, philan philanthropic money into con conservation. And um, can you explain what naturepreneurship does? Yeah, I, I do it very quickly. It's easy. We need nature conservation projects and then we need the entrepreneurial mindship because the work these two guys do, I really love it. And we, um, we, we need to bring more money in that work. And we need a hands-on approach, which is not only the ecosystem. And here are a lot of people who do great things for the ecosystem that we get the private sector activated. But we also have from... Um, the starting point are these projects and have then to develop business models which work today and not only in five or ten years. Thank you. Martin, And um, can you share your success story of, of the last decades in Ecuador, our proof of concept, so to say? Sure. Uh, what we've done in Ecuador is we scaled nature conservation 40-fold, uh, we brought in a lot more money, we generated income for the communities through increasing their livelihoods by working on regenerative agriculture, ecotourism, you need different income streams. That's the only way we can build resilient local economies in those frontier areas where really you do not have that resilience. Uh, and when COVID hit, people got hungry within six weeks. So, but they are our neighbors and we can help them and work with them towards a better future. 
And therefore, it's critical to really integrate the perspective of those local communities. Thank you. Um, the third reason of why we can embark on this mission is because we've got the nature conservation expertise on board. Uh, Christoph, can you please, for the people that don't know uh, the work of Frankfurt Zoological Society, can you <coughs> describe the impact, the scale, and um, the expertise? Yeah, I will try to do that very briefly. By the way, you see we have five orangutan more minutes. here, which is, of course, not in Ecuador, but we like the picture so much now, so that is why we, why we put it in here now. So yeah, our organization is working since more than 70 years. Serengeti shall not die. Might be in the heads of the older ones here in the, in the room. Now we are working in uh, 19 countries now with 30 programs. Um, we are concentrating really on the large biodiversity rich wild protected areas now as the backbone for conservation. Of course, we need all the other activities as well. We have to change production, we have to change agriculture, no doubt about it. But we need the backbone now and that is why we are concentrating um, there. We concentrate, as I explained, the anchor parks and then the broader landscape. So this is where we have to work with the communities, where we have to get alliances around these protected areas. And then finally, yeah, we have our boots on the ground now. Um, we are long term. Long term for us is decades. North Luanga, Zambia, 35 years. Peru, more than 30 years. Decades. That is the investments we have to do. And of course, we have to work in very strong partnerships now with local governments, with communities, with um, actors um, on the ground. And yeah, it's the house is on fire, and I, we heard that very often over these days. Now, we have to do more, and that is our ambition as well. Now, so we think we can do more, and we have to do more. Currently, our portfolio consists about uh, 250, 260,000 square kilometers, which is a quite significant part uh, of land, uh, also on, on biodiversity. That is about, on size-wise, 75% of, of Germany but we really want to double our impact in the next years. And for that, we need really also strong support, and that is also where we are happy to join forces with others now, like Nature Wealth and others. And we mainly want to expand in the Global South, and mainly in Africa, and mainly in South America. Now, where we find the richest biodiversity places. So we, we, are, we are starting with the areas where we are active in, then we are extending in the broader landscape, for example, from North Luanga into the South Luanga part in Northern um, Zambia. Um, and, and then finally, uh, we are on an expansion into new areas, new countries for us now, like currently Mozambique, Brazil, and some other high biodiversity countries. So there's a lot to do. But we are very ambitious and we think the house is fire, we have to get the water and we have to do the work. Thank you, Christoph. And Martin, can... Martin, would you, would you like to give some examples of the, uh, the portfolio that's already um, decided? Yeah, just very quickly. So, Augusta showed and started with the biodiversity hotspots on Earth. We know it's about 2% uh, of the Earth's surface that harbor 43% of vertebrates. So we know where to focus our efforts. And within our portfolio, we work with uh, the Zoological Society in Africa. We have projects in Indonesia, in South America. And we believe with a modest investment, we would be able to secure one third of global biodiversity. And that's the goal. And there is nothing that should stop anyone in this audience to not join forces with us. Thank you. And one last, one last take home message for you. So if you care about biodiversity and want to make a big difference, then be a first mover and support us. I think there's probably no other generation of mankind that can make such drastic positive changes. So be one of, the, one of those change makers for life on Earth. Thank you.